Okay. The question of decorum here, because there, there, those, especially the elderly who feel that the younger ones do, um, are not, don't have decorum when it comes to these political things, in delivering your message, in talking to the people, in handling pressure. How would that work? I, I presume maybe you are referring to my presidential candidate. I'm not talking to your presidential candidate. <laughs> okay, I'm talking so, to you as a young man. All right. So I think uh, in the course of this interview, you would appreciate the fact that it has been taking place under a very conducive uh, atmosphere. Uh, the fact remains that uh, by the standard of our African culture, young people are supposed to show quite a lot of respect to elderly people. Uh, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that you need to condone uh, what is wrong. And uh, if the people we have in authority today are the ones that have been mismanaging us for the past 19, 20 years, and uh, if respect is defined as the uh, elogizing uh, this same set of people for their conduct, then I think that is not the type of respect that we need to encourage. Uh, the type of decorum that I think we require at this point in time is the decorum to tell people in authority that, yeah, we think you have done well enough. Uh, in this area, we think you could have done uh, better. And uh, with due respect to those who are in the PDP and the APC, I think there's a general consensus among Nigerians that uh, these parties have had the opportunities to turn and move this country in the right direction, but uh, they have actually, fell, uh, they have actually uh, not performed as expected. And that is where the younger people are beginning to realize that we need to take our destiny in our own hands. If we continue to wait for those who have been in charge since the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, to create, uh, to create the path for us going uh, into the next uh, decade and uh, following then, uh, we might be missing it for a long time oh. to come. All right, Dr. Adoji, your brand of politics, I mean, the people you're campaigning, they're used to the previous political parties. Now, you coming into the fray, how's your experience been in terms of the acceptance and reaching out to the people? Well, they are used to the uh, two big political parties they are equally uh, sick and tired of failures uh, from the two political parties. So the experience has been quite interesting uh, in the sense that you get to meet the people uh, more in depthly. You get to meet them one on one. You get to speak. Uh, you got to speak to them about your programs, and you get to appreciate their difficulties. Which is why when people were talking about manifestos, I told them what I have with the people is a social contract, identifying what their needs are and seeing how you can leverage your connections and your position to, uh, to, to, to meet those needs. It's been quite difficult considering that the, most of these people are not very educated to sell the party platform, uh, to sell your candidature. What I'm telling you is actually been, you know, been, been, been interesting, especially when all those others who have been in office before now rarely or hardly met with these people. They just ran on the popularities of their parties and that's why you know, accountability has become very, very, has been very, very dismal from, you know, from their, 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 their end. So for me, it's about meeting the people, getting to know them, and getting them to feel uh, who their next line of leaders are. So it's been quite interesting and rewarding, if you may. Dr. Adoji, uh, let me get your thoughts on uh, this very peculiar uh, situation that has always popped up whenever we talk about politics, and that has to do with money. It is believed that... Uh, if you don't have the money, don't even go close to politics. Do you think that the paradigm shift with the support of the not too young to run bill, do you think that paradigm shift is really shifting at all? Well, to begin with, uh, I, I will advocate for a change of the not too, run, not too young to run bill to be not too young to lead. Because the not too young to run simply states that you can run but not win. So if, you, if, if we shift to be not too wrong, young to lead, that would make more sense to me. However, uh, straight to the heart of your question, money plays a very, very key role uh, you know, in politics and politicking in terms of logistics. Uh, the paradigm is shifting gradually. And um, I, I'm sure I'm going to be uh, the, 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 the first main apostle of a complete paradigm shift. Because I don't have money. I'm not rich but I have acceptability with the people because they trust me, they believe me, I know their problems, and we are out to, as a people, solve our common problems. So if you look at that uh, same scenario, and uh, perhaps you have a candidate who is going to be running for president also, and you talk about the logistics, let's get down to real terms now. If you have to have one rep 
at each polling unit, which we have there are about 5,000 of them, you'll be spending there are about 1.2 billion to just have your representative there for one day. Well, uh, <laughs> we have volunteers. Uh, it, will, it will please you to know that a lot of people have contributed their own funds, a lot of people have contributed their services, and people are volunteering to work for not even a dime. That is what makes this you know, uh, you know, a movement, uh, quite different from what you, what you used to have um, previously. Uh, so people are contributing, people are volunteering them, themselves you know, to work for us. So uh, the 1.5 billion you're talking about <laughs> is nowhere, nowhere in our, in our imagination. But we have people at the various polling units. Uh, in Kogi East, we have about 1,208 polling units, 98 wards. And there are people who are volunteering you know, to work for us at their own expense. So I don't see uh, us spending so much in terms of uh, you know, you know, you know, finance. Logistics, people are offering. People are offering their cars. They are offering their motorcycles. Most importantly, they are offering their time. And um, it, it, it's, it's, it's a tax that we are committed to pushing or pulling in the same direction with, and together we shall achieve that. What has it been like for you? Yeah, so I think Dr. captured it uh, quite uh, rightly and uh, very uh, clearly. Uh, starting from where it started, from the issues around not too young to run a uh, bill that was enacted into law, and he did mention that it should have been not too young to lead. In actual fact, there is a different dimension that I normally include, and I say we should actually have uh, not too poor to run uh, because uh, what they have used to scare us out of uh, taking part in the electoral process over time has been the fact that uh, people say a lot of money is involved for you to get into politics. And you just make an illustration of having 5,000 polling units and then you need to pay for the agents and then you spend 1.2 billion naira. The, the, the point remains that uh, uh, if you go down to the field, there's really poverty in the land. You can't run away from that. And I tell people that there are three categories of Nigerians today as we have it. You have the political elite who are lucky to have control of power as we speak. They are not going to relinquish that on a platter of gold. Uh, you have the downtrodden people who are really below the poverty line, who are really suffering, having it tough there. You need to go to the village. You won't get those people in Lagos on the average uh, uh, street in Lagos. You need to get to the village to know that for 500 naira, for 1,000 naira, there are guys who could do anything, just about anything for you. And those guys are the people who would come out to vote on election day. Those guys are not in a position to help themselves. And the challenge of turning this country around, I say, falls on the shoulder of the middle class. And that is where I commend doctor and people like myself who have taken the bold step to say we want to come out, leave our comfort zone. Middle class economically? It, middle class economically. Those of us who have... Do you have yeah, we are. So I, I, I won't classify myself as part of the political elite. I work in an international oil company, so I go to work Monday through Friday, normal basis, like you are here working right now. And we are see, you aware that there are over 90, uh, there are about 80 million people living below poverty lines in Nigeria? And those are the people I say the middle class has the bigger burden to see how we can help those people. Because those people we are saying are living below po poverty line are people who would not be able to help themselves. Somebody has not eaten for up to one week, he has not earned any income for one week, no hope of earning income, and then a politician comes around and say, I offer you 500 naira, 1,000 naira, and you are telling that person not to get swayed by that 1,000 naira. It will take a lot of enlightenment to change the mentality of that person. The people who can do that are those of us who have relatives, we have relations who are among those living below poverty line. They listen to us because they believe in our judgment. Do you think that there's vote buying currently taking place as we move towards 2019? Because uh, the complaints are that that must stop, according to INEC. Yeah, so uh, I, I will tell you that it's a positive development and it's also a negative development. And my explanation will be this. Uh, in 2007, for instance, nobody was hearing about vote buying. In 2011, nobody was hearing about vote buying. And the reason was simple. Elections were not being held. People sit down in hotel rooms, people sit down in their living rooms and concord election results and these are announced. And uh, with due appreciation to the last administration with the electoral reforms that took place, uh, the 2015 election was an improvement and then the votes that took place at the polling units actually reflected in the eventual results that were announced. At that point, the focus of politicians shifted that they could no longer write 
election results in their living rooms, they needed to go to the field to get those results uh, in their favor if they needed to get it. And so, positive because election results now count. Uh, negative uh, in the sense that we're, we are not there yet totally. Is vote buying taking place? The answer is an absolute yes. You talk about trader money that is taking place now. It is not very far from vote buying. Uh, just yesterday on Facebook, I have a, a classmate of mine, and uh, 